get on with things. So today's talk is going to be on sustainable techniques for gardening with native plants. So I kind of just took a, a few of my different concepts that we use in our gardens and things that I thought people could apply to their own gardens and I'm going to kind of walk you through it and just kind of showcase sort of our style of doing things. All right. So we're just going to jump right into it. So I think one of the first questions I always get asked about is like weed control and, and how sheet mulching can work and what's the best way to remove particular kinds of weeds and should they hand pull it or, or use uh, pesticides or whatnot. And, and my answer almost every single time, not every, every single time, almost, is sheet mulching. I think you can almost always get rid of whatever problem weeds with just really simple compost, cardboard, and mulch. And I think this example is is gonna really surprise you. So this garden was located in downtown San Jose. This was last fall. And this had the thickest layer of Bermuda grass I'd ever seen. I mean, it was like a foot thick of just straight rhizomes. I mean, it was, it was scary. I was kind of intimidated, actually. It's like, man, I'm a little nervous about this. It's like, you're really gonna put my, my, my sheet mulching philosophy to the test here. And so yeah, so this is basically what it looked like the first day we showed up. Um, just basically, literally, square, every square inch of that garden was just Bermuda grass, nothing else Bermuda, and pine weed too. So just in case the Bermuda guy wasn't to sprinkle some pine weed in there, it was nice. Um, so yeah, so this is the before picture. And so I told him, hey, I think your best bet and most economically feasible way is going to be sheet mulching it. Um, for a variety of reasons. One, the, we can get the mulch for free. So that's going to save them considerable money on buying mulch from a landscape yard, and also just getting the um, the cardboard you can get for free too. So all all he's basically is paying for labor, and so that was my my selling point to him. And so some tips on getting cardboard: you always want to make sure you're getting cardboard that does not have a glossy finish on the outside. So things without like. Sometimes you'll get, you know, you buy like a refrigerator and it'll have like a big glossy picture of the refrigerator itself. And so that usually has a lot of, the glue itself on the sticker has a lot of toxins in it and it's just the actual plastic it's on. So you want to always pull those off. Um, some tips on getting uh, cardboard. You can either buy the already recycled cardboard rolls from um, packaging supply places. The place that we go to is, um, Totally drawn like that. It's, it's APS. I can't even think of the acronym. What it is it stands for? It's off Center Road. Advanced Paper Systems. There you go. Advanced Paper Systems, and they sell you rolls of, of um, cardboard, recycled cardboard. It's 50 bucks a roll, so it's sort of pricey. So that's why the other option is to go and get your own cardboard, which can have some of its own time and money constraints because you have to make sure you have a, a source for it, and it's got to be enough cardboard to cover your lawn so you're not just making a million runs to wherever you're, to your dumpster diving or getting it from wherever. A few places I'd recommend getting it from are anywhere that sells large appliances because they come in big boxes. And usually they are, a lot of them are, are attached with staples versus, uh, versus having them be um, closed with tape. Because if you're doing sheet bolts, you get to remove all the tape. So if you can get boxes with staples, you can save yourself a ton of time. Removing the tape becomes the most time-consuming process of this whole thing. So if you can get no tape on there, you're saving yourself a lot of time. Yeah. I found a lot of cardboard if you go when the garbage people are coming mm -hmm. with the recycling. Mm -hmm. I've gotten card holders. Yeah, it's awesome. So the yeah. thing is, whenever you're going to grab some cardboard, try to get bigger boxes. Just and little boxes work just as good, but the little boxes offer more spots so the boxes are overlapping and every time there's an overlap there's one more spot the roots can pull through. Boxes work between trees. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the little boxes for the little weird nooks and crannies and weird spots where there's not a nice even edge. Little boxes do work great too. So it's nice having a little bit of, yeah. If you just pull off the glossy print side of cardboard boxes, will mm -hmm. the inner parts work? Sure, sure. I mean, if you sit there and pull off the little tape on 50 yeah. boxes, I mean, I, you're, it, it's, I it is it is not fun. All those boxes that go into yeah. the trash, mm -hmm. you get kind of salvage parts of them. 
totally, totally. But just, I mean, just keep in mind, I mean, how big your space is versus how much each one of those boxes go. So, and so, some so good solution on getting big boxes and getting places that because like, like you don't want to go there and get like five big boxes. You want to go there and get fifty at one time. So you want to make sure each time you're going there, it's going to be cost effective. So I've always found, find go to go to where if you find a good source, talk to the main person who can give you an actual decision on if you can take it or not. And just find out what days are their trash days. So the trash days on Thursday come on Wednesday night because they'll be all stacked up, ready to go. You just blow it right in your truck. And so call ahead, find out when they're going to be there, and if, get the permission. And usually they'll they'll kind of set up and prep for you, so you can just show up with your truck and toss it right in your truck. And um, I found the best places are bike shops, are really great because they have really big boxes and they're really thick because they have to support the the the, the way of the bike in there. Sometimes they're like four wall thick. I mean they're just crazy thick, and they're, and they all connected with staples. There's no tape on them most times. And so bike boxes work fantastic. And some of those bike shops are getting 10 bikes a day that they're rebuilding. So you can go there and get huge loads of bike boxes. Another good place is garage door installers. So when they install their new garage doors, they get their garage doors to come in these huge boxes. I know they're fantastic too. So those are all good sources for doing, um, for sourcing the cardboard, which can be the hardest part. Yeah? Uh, two questions. Um, I heard that white boxes also, what, about, what about the print on the boxes? The print's okay. The print is usually soy-based ink. Okay. So white in any of the boxes, basically anything white, whether it's flour, sugar, whoever, it's been bleached. Okay. So if it's a white box, it's been bleached. So that's just a rule of thumb. If it's white, it's been bleached. So if you want to not have reduced chemicals, don't get white boxes. Just the ones, just the brown, just, you know, no color on it. Least amount of writing, those are optimal. Um, so, when you're doing your, are, are you guys familiar with Toby Hemingway and Guy's Garden by chance? So, he, yeah. he has his bomb proof sheet mulching, which works great. Um, so, it basically, it's just you know a, a system of stacking your organic matter. You know, you want to you add your um, this is your initial soil surface, the grade right here. It's good to add some manures and compost one layer of your cardboard, some mulch, some more cardboard, or um, some mulch, some compost, and if you want, another layer of cardboard and mulch on top of that. That's if you really want to have a heavy duty, super heavy duty uh, um, sheet mulch. The more basic one is sort of just this right here, which is just layer of compost, layer of cardboard, layer of, this has grass clippings, but you want. Um, arbor mulch. Arbor mulch is the best stuff to use for a variety of reasons. Arbor mulch is free for the best reason and they'll deliver it to your house. So the best way to get arbor mulch um, is go on Google, just do a search. So if you live here in San Jose, just say tree arborist in San Jose and you'll get 50 arbors. And so just start calling, just write them down, call 10 of them. And just basically say, hey, I'm doing a, a landscape project my front yard, I need a lot of mulch, are you guys doing any project? Give me your address and say, are you doing any projects in my neighborhood within the next week? If you have some available, drop some off my house. And I'll say, they'll take down your address, and say if we're, in there, if, you're, if we're working there this week, we'll call you and we'll drop off the load if you have them available. So the, the way it works, go. I'm sorry, I was curious about, does that provide softwood for terminals? Well, if you're, getting, if you're getting mulch from the landscape supply store, it's going to be just as susceptible to termites as one of the arbor mulch. So if you're, I mean, mulch is going to be just as susceptible to termites as, in, as the tree in your front yard. Um, so, and I, I can go over some, some techniques on keeping uh, termites out in a little bit. Yeah. Um, so the, in terms of, of requesting mulch from, from the companies, so the way it works for them is they're only willing to drop off mulch if it's cheaper for them to drop it off at your house and take it to the dump. So. That's why they want. That's why they want to do it for free. It's because it costs them a couple hundred bucks every time they go to the dump to deliver it, plus the time to get there, the labor, wear and tear in their truck. So, but if if they're doing a job on First Street and you live on 10th Street and they're only going to go 10 blocks to get to your house, they're going to do it. But they're not going to go across San Jose to drop off your load of mulch. So that's why you want to call a bunch of different arborists. You let them all know, hey, I need a load of mulch. Just letting a bunch of guys know. So bad. 
the odds is at least one of those 10 companies is going to be doing a garden or a project somewhere around your house within the next week or so. That's just the odds of it. It just, it always, it, I, every time it always works. So you call, if you, if you don't get an answer in a couple days, just call 10 more because there's hundreds of tree companies out there. If you just look around and you just see tree trucks, you'll be amazed at how many tree trucks you see out there. A lot of times I'll see a guy driving, I'll get this, at a red light, I'll see a tree truck, I'll jump out of my truck, I'll look in the back of his truck, and if it looks like a good load, I'll just give my address and I'll drop it off. Dude, I mean, once a week that happens. And there's, because there's so many trucks out there, it's amazing once you keep an eye out for it, how many times you see those the arborists. And so when you call them, always ask them what the tree, um, what kind of tree work they've been doing. So you really want to make sure there's no palm trees, no acacia trees, no privet trees, um, no tree of heaven, um, just make sure it's not something that's overly sick. Um, and then also ask them what the ratio, to, uh, ask them if it was a trimming job. You don't have to ask the, the, this part of it, but if you want to be really particular on not having any green waste, because sometimes you see it and it's like, oh, it looks really green. I don't want that, it looks really green. Always remember, in about a week, all of it will dry out to one uniform color. So I, I don't care what color, it could be purple. In a week, it'll look brown. Because once the sun gets in there, it's going to all brown out to one color. So don't, don't get caught up on what it looks like when it first dries up. As long as it doesn't look like it's like 90% green matter, because then even though it will brown out, it'll still look like just dried leaves. You want to have at least a good amount of the wood chips in there, so it's still, even when it dries out, so it has a nice, good texture to it. So you started to say you want to, if possible, ask them. Oh yeah, so if possible, when you call them, ask them, say, was it a tree removal or a tree trimming job? So tree removal jobs are going to provide you more woody matter tree trimming jobs are going to, it's going to be more small branches, leaves, and stuff like that. And actually it's good to have a, a ratio of both because the small stuff will break down within the first couple of months and give you some quick organic matter into your, into your soil and the bigger chunks will take a couple of years to break down and that's sort of your long-term mulch covering. So you're going to get multiple benefits from it. You're helping add some organic, compo organic, organic material to your compost and getting some top dressing. So I, I always look for the, the best mixture, I think is maybe 20 to 15% green waste, or a green matter, or like leaf, uh, leaves and whatnot. So if you, anywhere in there is a, good, is a good percentage to be at. So, sorry, but that's just some good, if you're ordering mold, those are all good things to know when you're calling them on a phone, because you want to make sure that you're not, you want to make it as painless for them and you as much as possible because it becomes a big pain for them to always be working with, with uh, residents to get this mulch, they're not going to do it. So if you, come, if you call them prepared, you know what you're asking about, you know what you're looking for, they're much more likely to want to work with you and do this. So just have a plan ahead of time, know what you want, know what you're asking for and it's going to make it a lot easier for you. And one thing most, uh, not most, a lot of them won't, technically it's illegal for them to deliver their mulch on the street in front of the curb. Some guys will do it, whatever, they don't care. But it depends on how soon you're going to remove it. So if you got, hey, I got five guys here, even if you put it in the street, it's going to be moved in two hours, it's no big deal. But if you're like, hey, it's going to be here, and over the next two months, I'm going to slowly put it in my backyard, like they're not going to want to do that because they're going to get them in trouble. You're going to probably get a ticket, and neighbors going to hate you. So try to have it delivered in the driveway, and try to have four or five guys ready to, to move it as soon as possible. And one thing too, these are fresh wood chips, so they're hot. Like they're, like, they're going to deliver it and it's going to look like it's on fire, it's steaming so much. So the longer it sits in your driveway, the more it's breaking down, and the more you're going to have broken down looking mulch. So if you really particularly want nice looking mulch, spread it quickly. Because if, you, if it just sits there, I mean, this, I mean, these mulch piles are like this big. So there's enough thermal the mass in there, it's going to break down really quick. It's nice to put your hand there, you, you, you can't touch it, it's so hot. So you really want to spread it quickly. And just so have, have it ready, have a spot to dump it, have guys ready to do it. And if, you, if possible, have it delivered on concrete versus have it, having it delivered on dirt, because it's way easier to scoop up. So the easiest way to do it is scooping up with snow shovels, just aluminum tip snow shovels, because you can get bigger loads, the shovel's really light, but you can't use a snow shovel on dirt. So if you're doing it concrete, you want a snow shovel. If you're doing it on dirt, use a pick. Or not pick up a, a pitchfork. So those are, those are tips on moving it um, and ordering it. So because I think it's a great resource to get that armor mulch, but just you know know how to use it, so it's it's painless for you. Sorry. So tips for successful, successful sheet mulching: apply as many layers as possible. I always try, depending on 
what kind of weed it is. Things like Bermuda grass, I mean, three or four layers is not out of the question. If it's just um, dandelions and some common, you know, weeds, one layer is probably be enough. Buying weed, you could do a hundred, and they're not gonna—it's gonna go right through it. <laughs> you're not—you're not getting rid of buying weed. That's just—that's just that. You're not getting rid of buying weed. <laughs> it's there. It's—it's it's not going anywhere. Um, but you can control it, but it's it's the fact of the matter. It's bindweed's really, really aggressive. They have, I think in my Master Gardener class, we had someone come in and talk about bindweed, and there's been reports of bindweed going 60 feet into the ground. So you're not getting rid of bindweed. Bindweed, quick digging it out. Yeah. Oh, the best thing you can do about bindweed is have other plants in there to compete against it, so that the bindweed can't just go uninhibited through your garden. So and that's, that's even more reason why you should be doing xeriscaping your garden. Because the more water adding to it, the more you're making that bioweed happy, the more likely that that bioweed's never going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, even without water, they're still going to be aggressive. Um, so overlap each box. So like, let's say if I, these are two big pieces of cardboard I'm laying down. Overlap them. A third to a quarter is good, um, good rule of thumb. If it's, if it's, if you're limited on boxes, you don't have a lot of boxes, you're just going to barely get enough to cover your area. And your weeds aren't that aggressive, you know, maybe an inch or two would be fine. Just to do this. Or one thing I'd say do, do too is get your first layer, you know, maybe not have a lot of overlap. And then if you're worried about just covering it, you always come back, you know, a month or two later and do a whole other layer. So just. I have a question um, about that cardboard. Yeah. Um, we can get it in a lot of different ways. Like we can get it in rolls. Is that considered usable? I mean, you would need, like, House. I mean, millions. Here's what I would say: if, if you want to, if you want to reuse your toilet paper rolls, yeah. use them for starting seedlings. Yeah. Take take them, cut them in half, and you can use a little piece of cardboard for the bottom, and you can start your seedlings in there. So if you want to, if you want to use that, you know, find a way to dodge stone in the garden for this thing, you know, use it with it. Um, so I'm going to try to move this. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of getting caught up on a couple things. So I want to make sure we get through everything. So we moved the tape. We already went over that. Thick boxes, the better. Um, so we covered just by all of this. Um, so here's an example of people sheet mulching. This isn't a garden that we did. Just some pictures I found online. Um, I couldn't get any pictures that we were doing as we were sheet mulching. Um, but see, this is an example of the small boxes. I mean, look how many little, I mean, it's ridiculous. This is a little better because there's some bigger ones. You can see how much easier it is to lay down there. And sometimes it's like, the small boxes are good to kind of put in these little spots in there up by the tree. Kind of fills and makes it a little easier to do. Isn't Where? Oh, this is a newspaper. Oh. This is a newspaper right here. New newspaper will work too. Just takes a lot more. If you have a small area, if you're just got like a vegetable planter bed, small little raised beds, newspaper works just great. Um, so this is that same garden. This is the before picture. This is actually still in progress. So the, the homeowner was doing a lot of the work with us. So it was kind of just doing it in phases a little bit. But this was, this was about a month later after, after this. This was 60 yards of sheet mulch, of, of 60 yards of uh, arbor mulch. So then we had like five deliveries to cover this, all for free. If you had to buy that mulch, I mean, that would have been so many thousand dollars of mulch. And here's the thing. So when you're buying mulch, you're only going to lay enough mulch to cover the ground. Because who wants to pay a ton of money for mulch that you can't even see? Mm -hmm. So you're going to do just enough to cover it, but why do four inches of mulch when you pay for three inches of mulch that you can't even see? Like, that's hard for people to kind of get over that. Versus getting it for free, who cares? Give me two feet thick, who gives a shit? You didn't see it, like, you can't see it, it doesn't matter, it's all free. Versus buying some nice mulch at the store, you know, you're only going to, you're going to be very judicious with it. So that's why I love using this mulch. Like, you just can just go to town with it. You're not worried about, oh, I spent so much money on this, who cares? Just, just spread it and put it to use. And it's already a, a material that's going to go to the landfill. So here's another example of, um, this is another Bermuda grass lawn. I mean, this was just, just like the other one, not quite as bad, but, and so this is the after picture of what it was after we did the sheet mulching. And we didn't, we didn't pull one weed. I mean, the all, all, only thing you have to do with sheet mulching is trench around the corners. So, and a little, a little example, it's actually a really, really important part of sheet mulching, so I want to make sure you guys get this. So, let's 
let's just say this is this is just a really basic square lawn. There's a fence around, I guess, whatever. So if this is if this were the grade of the soil, and you go and put you know let's say four inches of mulch on it. So now your mulch is going to be sort of up here. And now your grade is all kind of messed up now. Because you're way too, you're, you're way too above. Let's say this is a sidewalk. You have mulch always falling on the sidewalk. It gets to be really annoying. And so to keep this from happening, you come around the, the, the sides. So this is concrete, and this is the grass. Come and trench a little spot next to it. Four inches, four inches wide, and four inches deep this way. So what that does is kind of allows you for a, a bit of a transition for the concrete. So if this is the concrete, here's the concrete, and here's where, here's where you just dug that little trench down. It allows the mulch to sort of have a slow way where it can kind of transition down and fill in this little gap where you trenched versus it being above the concrete one to spill over all the time. It sounds really simple, but a lot of people kind of, even besides we're out there, we're kind of forget the trench there, and it makes a really, really big difference. This makes it so much easier after the fact. And the, the whatever you use to trench on the sides, um, like take all the extra soil, and you can use it to build like a little mound somewhere. And I take that little mound, it gives you more planting area, it gives you a little kind of change in the grades, you can, a little more visual interest. But you, you, this is absolute necessity. You cannot overlook doing this. You have to trench around every single hardscape, anywhere where there's like a, a raised bed, um, anything, anything that's concrete. It's like right here where it's, it's hard to see. It's, you can see where the concrete goes. You want to make sure you trench all around that and also along the fence. So I just want to make sure you guys got that. It's kind of a subtle little thing, but it's definitely important. It'll make your life a lot easier after the fact. Alright, so, sorry about that. And so, that was kind of my last little thing about sheet mulching. My next slide is going to go into some um, permeable material. So, is there any questions uh, pertaining to sheet mulching? You said a $50 for a roll. How much square area does that cover? So, it really depends on how much you overlap it. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing one layer versus you know two or three layers, I would say 20 by 20 spot. If you're doing, if you're overlapping a lot, I just 10 by 10. But sometimes you know if, if you don't have the time to go and, and source all this, and, and if you have a truck, it's hard to go get this this um, the cardboard. And advanced paper systems will deliver as long as it's $100 or more. So as long as you're ordering at least two rolls to deliver to your house. So for some of you, the, the, the pain of going and finding the material, taking a tape off to go that, is like, screw this. So you might just be like, hey, call in, give me five rolls, speed your driveway the next day. It might be a lot easier for you. And, and it's still recycled cardboard. So you're still using, you're still using uh, diverting waste from the landfill. So even though you're not getting it right from, the, you know, it's still been processed a little bit, it's still better than the alternative. Any other questions pertaining to sheet mulching? Did you say you trenched between the garden elements also? Like Here, yeah. Well, this mean this this came in afterwards, which is so. I mean, all we did was trench here along the fence, back around here, and that's it. Like if you had a, a hill, a hill or a berm in the somewhere. Berm's okay because you know. Let's if here's the berm. Sorry. If here's the berm. That's a little exaggerated, but you don't need to trench right here because just you know the mulch will sort of kind of just fill in that area on its own. You, you know you're not really worrying about controlling that spilling into another part. It's more just keeping your trenching to keep mulch from going onto your your pathways, going into the sidewalk, going in the street, and have to constantly sweep it. That's that's the main goal, and and keep your and keeping all your grade the same. But a pond is different, right? You oh, you you need you need to do that for the pond for sure. I mean, I'll, I'll see if I, I, if I had another picture where, to answer, to make your question easy to visualize, I'll put it out to you. So I'm going to go in talking about some perennial pathways, so different examples for perennial pathways in a garden. 
So the benefit of permeable pathways is is reducing um, erosion on site, keeping water on in the garden, um, and using using the, they come out to be usually a more sustainable material than using just concrete. So here's, I have a couple of different examples. So this is a garden that we did recently in Los Gatos. Um, another company had come in and did did the paving work in a driveway, and they wanted to have something that went from the sidewalk into the street. And so she, it asked us for some different you know possibilities of using you know different hardscape materials. And so they still had all this kind of random broken up pieces that these guys had left over in a side yard. And like, oh, we want to get rid of this. We, like, can you take it to the landfill? Like, what can we do? We're like, you want to get rid of that and you want a pathway, so I'll just kill two birds with one stone. I'll just use your old bricks and make a pathway out of it. And it worked great because we, we didn't have enough to do it solid like that, so we just did kind of a little stepping stone pattern, set them in concrete, and now the water can kind of infiltrate around it, and we put little plants to kind of fill in the gaps a little bit too. So it, it I wish I had a, a more recent picture. You could see the plants filling in, but that was for permeability with the rain. And same thing with this too. Which is, these are just old pieces of redwood that we had cut and laid in there. Allows the water to kind of fill in through the cracks. Gives it kind of a cool rustic feel of the garden. Even Coco the dog is excited about it. He's checking it out. And so here's a couple more examples. Um, these are just um, salvaged pieces of redwood that we just um, cut into rounds as stepping stones. And this is also a piece of um, salvaged redwood piece as a bridge too. So these are all act as low impact um, paving, allows water to infiltrate through, really simple. This also, this is urbanite set in DG, which is another great way to use um, reuse material. And, and urbanite is the generic term for reusing concrete. Yeah, yeah, it's a fancy designer and way to use salvage concrete, sorry. What, what's it set in again? Uh, decomposed gray. Oh. DG, like gold finds. And the the use, setting them in the DG or setting the urbanite in the DG allows you to use a little bit less DG too because it takes up some of the volume of the DG, so it saves a little money there as well. And this is another example of when we did in uh, Saratoga. And you, even the little redwood piece, the little 4 by 4s are salvaged from a, a, a greenhouse we took apart. And you can also see an example of the arbor mulch built too. Actually, if you look at the top of that picture, where, the, where that curb strip is, that's a really good example of when you should trench. Because if you don't trench that up at the top, you have mulch going all into the street, in the sidewalk. So that's, because of, I mean, it's only this wide. So if you're not if you're not improving the grade on the side, it's just going to be constantly going in there. Now we can add a really really thick layer of mulch. It, it, it will never go in the street, but you still can get away with doing like four or six inches, no problem. Can you put board on that? No, no, I, I rarely ever. Oh, this has bender board. This is redwood bender board. That's one of the few times I use it. I try not to really ever use bender board. Like if you look, neither one of these has bender board in there. I I don't think it's really ever you know, that needed. And if I do use bender board, I try to use red with bender board well, versus the plastic. Well, you're not sawed down, and yeah. that's what it stops. Yeah, exactly. Just some people like to put them on all kinds of places. Just I think I think they're just the bender board sometimes. They just love using bender board. And so a couple more examples. So this is DG without the urbanite. Here's some more just red rounds we built. This is at, at Books in Elementary School, and they had they worked out really great here because they had or yet like a redwood grove. And they had a little, a little deck area that kids would go and they would have like read books and the teacher would have a little outdoor lesson plan. And so they kind of gave like a little kind of rustic little spot, a kind of whimsical way for the kids to kind of walk into the, to the redwood grove area. And it matches because the redwoods are also matched with the rounds too. And so, so this is, we do a lot with salvage redwood. So I just showed a couple other examples of different ways you can use repurposed redwood. One of the things that we like and all, some of our customers love doing, love the way these look is just using their redwood rounds as a, as a hose reel. Because you get these ugly plastic ones that start cracking from the UV and they're a pain to wrap around, they never really reel. So you just use a big log, it's so easy to wrap around it, it fits into the garden, you can even put your watering can on it, some tools on it, you can sit on it, like so it has multiple features and it looks more aesthetically pleasing than a plastic one, yeah. Where do you get your redwood? Is that, is that secret? A, <laughs> <laughs> 
We, I have one of the guys that works for me, his dad lives up in Santa Cruz Hills. And so either him or a neighbor, there's a tree that falls down, that they're felling one because it's too close to a house. So at least once a month, we have access to a redwood tree. And I own a bunch of big chainsaws. We just go up there and just chain, chainsaw them down. We have, a, we have a mobile mill too, so we can mill all the wood on site. So we can just go up there and we, we can take these big logs and mill the lumber to build a house like right there on site. And so you can build benches and steps and all kinds of cool stuff out of it. And it's just kind of fun using the chainsaw. <laughs> yeah, so we did, these are just examples of a bench. Actually here is this, this was a dog garden we did on De La Cruz Avenue. And instead of using traditional bender board, we just cut these, these uh, bigger pieces into really thin little slices and use that as bender board. That made look, they kind of made it look a little meandering too. And so it kind of gives it a little more of a natural look to it instead of just like this store-bought cheesy looking bender board. So here's some other examples of using the redwood rounds. Um, we, had, we had a customer who was really into cats. And so he's like, we can carve you something out of the redwood rounds. He's like, could you make me a cat? So we made this sort of kind of little intimidating looking cat. It's her little, her little, she calls her a warrior cat in front of her house. So it protects her house. And it's another little example. We, did a, we made a, a little snake table out of this little off cuts and different rounds. And this is, actually, this is in my living room now. I didn't want to, I liked it so much I kept it. <laughs> um, and actually, we stained it and added some colors on it. It looks, it looks really cool. And this is another just a little bench with some redwood steps. Kind of, you know, we like all of our gardens to look very, like, naturalistic, like you, what you'd see on a hike or in the forest somewhere. So we kind of put some ferns in it. This is part of a little redwood grove, bottom corner. And it's another example of some different, these are burls that we carved on top. So different ways of using, I mean, this is all complete discarded redwood that was going to go to the landfill that we took and did something beautiful with it. And so this is a, a garden that we did um, in Willow Glen. And we removed, the house was built in the early 40s and had the original irrigation system in it. It was this really old cast iron metal irrigation system. And we pulled it out and had this, this, this old valve and they looked like little eyes. And so we're trying to think of how we could reuse it, and, and the homeowner is a, is a beekeeper, so we took it, and he sells honey on his porch, so we took his, one of his old bee boxes right here, and we put a little frame around it, and made it look like a little character, and that's his little promotional you know, item for selling honey. And his, the kids talked to him, they named him Irrigation, <laughs> that's his name, and they, just, they love it. And they, 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 they jump on the little logs next to it, and they, they sit on This is another example of how we do the the logs and the hose reel. The kids just sit on it and they hang out next to it and this they totally engage. There's a we have a little wildflower meadow next to it and they even like pictures of both the kids in the garden doing their homework in the wildflower meadow and you know I think it's just a fantastic way to get the kids excited about being in the garden and seeing something different and something fun they can really engage. And that's urbanite over in that other one. Yeah, urbanite's well in there too. Do you have a layer under the um, granite? Of anything? Is there sand or anything under that? Um, you, can, you, you can do base rock. Because, I mean, the sand and DG are such similar drainage consistency, you might as well just do all the DG. Oh, okay. you know? They're almost the same price. DG is a little bit more expensive. Um, the DG we use has a binding agent in it, too, so it compacts down a little better. And that way you don't always have it sand. making a big mess everywhere. The one with the, with the glue in it is a little more expensive as well. Or you can add the glue later on, whichever you prefer. And if, if you. Um, they, what do they call, they call it? Um, they have a name for it. The, um, give me a second, it'll pop in my mind. They have a name for the one with the glue in it. Um, so here's some examples of um, of using found objects on site and repurposing items. So we did a, a garden, and she wanted um, some different raised beds, and she wanted an herb spiral. And she had all these bricks on site, so we just used the bricks she already had there and dry stacked them into a little herb spiral and then she planted them with all different herbs and whatnot for her raised beds. And these are raised beds made from old garage doors. So from the same guy I get the, the uh, boxes from, I actually go and get the actual old garage doors too. So I use the old stuff and the, new, the stuff the new, box, the, the new garage doors came in. So try to, I, go and, I also get pallets from him too. So I go there, it's like my one stop source for material. Okay. I can't tell you where that is, but you guys can find your own other garage doors. <laughs> there are a lot of them out there. 
Okay. What's underneath the uh, rock? Is that cardboard? Right here? Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, this, this one is just with the, uh, the rolls of cardboard. Another, another, way, if, another way to get car, uh, rolls of cardboard, if you don't want to get it from advanced paper systems or any other packaging supply places, you can get rosin paper from just Home Depot or Orchard. And just, or sometimes they call it construction paper, rosin paper. Basically just stuff they put down when the painters or whatever they're working, they don't want to get stuff on the floor, they just put rosin paper. I would only use rosin paper if you have weeds that aren't really aggressive. So if you just want something basic, or if you like, there aren't really any weeds at all, you know, only a few things, but you want some extra protection, just throw some rosin down, and that works good. But if you have Bermuda grass or anything really aggressive, that's, they're going to they're gonna laugh at that. That's gonna, they're going to come to that in like two weeks. So don't use it for that. And then also, if you're doing Bermuda grass, you, before you even put down the sheet, once you got to get chance to mention this before, is you want to do a little bit of hand removal first. Like, I mean, some of those ones I showed you that were just ridiculous. I mean, there's no way. Hand removal is just going to be, just, you're spinning the wind. But if you have, you know, a smaller garden that's not too bad, and you have just one little area that's kind of really aggressive, do a little bit of hand removal there first, and get that out before you do your overall sheet mulching. You're going to get some, get a little better results. Um, so here's another um, project we did. And so this was an existing driveway. And it was just a regular, traditional, just poor driveway. And she wanted to re reduce the uh, water runoff of the property. And she spoke with another contractor who was trying to get her to rip out the whole driveway and then lay a whole new driveway with this new permeable material. And to me, I thought that was sort of kind of against like the sort of the spirit of doing a permeable driveway if you're causing so much other impact just to get rid of the old driveway. It kind of didn't really make any sense. So, I mean, oh, unless it was a driveway that was already cracked and needed to go anyways, then it wouldn't make sense. But this is a perfectly fine, I mean, the only part about this driveway was bad was this crack. And that was enough for you to remove the whole driveway. So I suggested just doing some cuts in the driveway, right here, right here, throughout, and just backfill it with gravel rock. And then we took the gravel walk and we added a binding agent similar to the DG. And that way, if the gravel doesn't spill everywhere, you can drive right over it. And it's no problem. And so this is actually designed to have two cars so that each of the tires drive on each one of these. And then the middle of the car sits right here. Each one of these sidewall areas were added just to create some extra area for the, the, the flow to kind of collect into. So when you're cutting out a driveway, you're going down into the rebar? Um, yes. If they have rebar, not all drivers have rebar. Depends on who did it, how good a job they did it, when it was done, what kind of concrete they used, soil conditions, whether or not they were being cheap. So you never know if there's rebar in it. You kind of just got to figure out until you, you start cutting. I applaud you for thinking about the waste that you're generating from oh. doing Totally. And, and a lot of it just, it's, it becomes a cost thing too. Sometimes people want to have a really sustainable garden, but the cost is the main deterrent. Well, so if you I can, find that people like slicing those, um, you know, the rocks to make it look like urbanized. Mm -hmm. I have gotten almost truckloads of, they only want the big oh, yeah. pieces. Yep. And they'll throw away. Pieces, yeah. Because the little pieces are really hard. It's hard to find a creative way to reuse those. The, the I mean, problem. it's like you said, it's great for me. I've yeah. got half my quarter acre in yeah. this stuff. <laughs> There's always a solution. You just got to think outside the box a little bit. There's always a way to figure out a, a use for the materials. Just in the little imagination. And so another feature of the same garden. So this, if you look to the left where that arbor is, or for the doorway. So they had this whole front area from from here on up was just solid concrete. From all this was just, every inch was just all concrete. And it would create so much in it, it's south facing too. So just the combination of the sun hitting it and the sun reflecting from the concrete in front of the door, it was almost unbearable, she would say, tell me. And the door actually in front, it was a brand new door, but get so sun faded from the heat and exposure after a year or two it would look like crap. So she wanted some ideas on how she could, you know, make it so it could, the water could permeate better and reduce the heat as well. And the same person who said pull out the driveway also suggested just ripping out all this concrete. Oh, and I thought that just was, was, was ridiculous and just didn't even make any sense. And 
And so I said, hey, we'll just take these steps and we'll just kind of round them, round them off so they look real nice. Put the cuts in the front so the water as it rains and be channeled into these side planting areas. The, the arbor adds shade, so it cools the heat of the house and also allows for some shade for the ferns. You really want a ferns in here, this is all fern and shade living plants. And we planted a um, California grape to sort of grow along the arbor and create additional shade for the ferns and for the front of the house. Is that just finished a photo or is that like a year later? This was not even 24 hours ago. Oh, okay. My guys are right here installing this today still. Okay. I'm going to leave here and go to this house to finish it. <laughs> so cutting so out is, the areas could also be a solution where there's tree root uh, damage on existing mm -hmm. hardscape. Yeah, totally. And actually, just so we're talking about knowing you don't know what's under the concrete to start cutting. So we started cutting this, and there was a whole other concrete patio below mm -hmm. it. So it was like this thick of concrete. Oh, and so there's no way to know until you start cutting. So. <laughs> Anyway. Is permeable concrete more expensive than regular if you have to do? Um, yes, because not a lot of people, I mean, it doesn't take any more time material to do it, it actually takes less material because it's sort of a specialized technique and not everyone can do it, They're, they just charge more for it. Uh, um, all, all, all permeable concrete is is concrete with less water. So it, it, it kind of creates almost natural air gaps in it. There's some more to it, but that's the, the basic of it. Since you said there was concrete underneath, what did you do with that concrete underneath? Because if the ground's not permeable. Yeah, so we had, we, we had to, first off, we cut we cut this out with the with the saw to get yeah. these, these pieces with the aggregate in it. And the pieces below, it was too hard to get the saw to cut, so that part we actually had to use a jackhammer and that came up in like little roll pieces. Okay. So that really wasn't able to be reused, which is unfortunate, but there was there wasn't really any way to get around it. So you did get rid of it? Yeah, we had. There's, there's no choice, because there also be no way to, there's no way to plant the plants or set these in concrete. Right. These are four by sixes, and so they need, they need to be. These got set three feet deep, so we had to get. I mean, so basically from here down was like this, like this deep okay. well, to set the four by sixes. Yeah, change. exactly. Then you'd have they'd be like a little pool almost. And yeah, and so the other thing we did, we took. Pieces that we cut from in there, we use the stepping stones in the, in the garden. It kind of creates a transition, so it doesn't go right from concrete to DG. You kind of put a couple steps in there, sort of soften the transition for the two types of materials. Um, I think of another image. Do cement where the tree roots raise the concrete? Um, the tree roots raise the concrete. Did you just have to deal with that? Just there really weren't any tree roots. This 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 yard basically had nothing but just grass and weeds. But if, wait, wait, so, um, just repeat your question one more time, I'm not, well, not sure if I got it all. Like, we have concrete where trees raised mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. This is common, very common. I don't know, it's like, that, that's a real problem. I was right to, to do this project, do you just leave it, or do you actually dig deeper and get rid of it? Um, it would really be like a case-by-case case mm -hmm. scenario, or, uh, you know, depending on the project. If it's if it, if that's happening on the curb, you're really limited to what you can do because it's sort of like a public city right of way, so you really can't just cut into it per se. But it's still your responsibility to maintain. Like if someone trips over it, it's your it's you're liable for whatever happens if that person gets hurt. So you have to do something to maintain it. But they don't always like permit to just cut the concrete in whatever way you see fit. I think so it's sort of a, one of the cities has something that because of these tree roots, it looks almost like rubber or resin or mm -hmm. something that is exactly like it smarter is. to it's put up. putting concrete it's back. ground up tires. Yeah. Ground, ground, old tires are the hardest thing. You can't recycle old tires. They're the most difficult thing to recycle. So they're always trying, trying to find ways of reusing them. And so they, they take tires and a similar bonding agent they use for this, this the, the gravel they put with the tires. And just, that way it can flex a little bit. Mm -hmm. You could buy that at the big box store. Mm -hmm. I think I'm actually bought some. It's okay. <laughs> um, so here's this is the same garden, the same house as this top one right here. So uh, along with the major features in the driveway and the doorway, we connected all the downspouts around the house to keep all the water inside. Here's some of the examples of, of some downspouts that we connected. Um, and 
over here as well too. And actually this garden has urbanite stepping stones as well too. This is kind of cool. So on, on the way when I was driving to this house one day, it's in Willow Glen, we were looking for some urbanite and I've been looking on Craigslist. I couldn't find that on Craigslist. I was, I was getting frustrated. Man, it's urbanite so bad. I got a job done on Friday and I don't have time to look for it. It was like Thursday morning. I was just I was getting nervous. I was like, I don't know how we're going to do this. As I'm driving up Thursday morning, I see someone across the street moving their driveway. And I, I just saw a bobcat and a big dump truck. I'm like, I bet you that they're going to rip out that driveway. It was parked right in there. All the cars cleared out and it was parked right in front. And my was like, are you guys going to pull the driveway by any chance? Like, oh yeah, it's coming out right when my guys show up. I was like, perfect. Well, we need some used concrete. So if there's any way we can work together and get you to break them up in nice big pieces, he was like, that sounds great. And so he cut them up in these nice, big, huge pieces for us that made really easy stepping stones. Carried them, like, basically across the street and used them for that. And it was they were perfect. You know? Nature gods were with yeah. you. Yeah. Well, one thing I've learned, as I'm driving around, I'm always just looking for job sites and looking for, I find my best stuff just driving around at the job sites. Like that, 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 that one of those first pictures where I saw those redwood trees. And my first time I ever did that was we were doing a job in, in up in Saratoga, and around the corner I see a guy like 40 feet up in, the, in this redwood tree, this big chainsaw. I'm like, that tree's about to come down. I'm like, what are you guys gonna do with that tree? He's like, oh, it's all going to the landfill. We're gonna take the landfill right to this. I'm like, oh my god, that's criminal. Like, I mean, this tree was huge. Take it right to the landfill. I mean, that's just it's asinine. And then so I said, hey, can we get these re these logs? Like, well, it's all or nothing. There's no taking five and we're taking the rest. We take all of it. And it's like, I'll take this and more if you have it. I was like, I love it. And he cut these nice big pieces for us and delivered it right to the job site. It just was awesome. I wouldn't have seen if I wouldn't look at it. Yeah. Back in the 70s, my mom, I guess some of the garden shops used to sell the redwood mm -hmm. lights, and they kind of disintegrated over time. So do you have an idea of what the life is on those? Yeah, I mean, I would say on most of these, it really depends on soil conditions, what you're setting them in. If you're setting them in just dirt with sediment of sand, or send them in a little base rock, okay. and keeps what that it drier. yeah it keeps it drier and it keeps any like insects from just sort of hibernating down there. Because once there's once you have your redwood rounds, a bunch of cool wet areas, you're just gonna mm -hmm. everything in the world's gonna want to hang out down there. Worms and decomposers and beetles that they're just they're just gonna rot away that redwood. So you put a little bit of put a little bit of DG, a little bit of sand, base rock, and then put that around top of it. And the cool thing is usually when we have the redwood, when we're doing the steps, we usually have some leftover DG or base rock from some other part of the project and just use a little bit of that for the stepping stone. And you can, you can get reused base rock too. And the reused base rock is just old broken up concrete. So using one more reused mm -hmm. material. On that left or left hand picture, how did you figure out how big to make that drainage ditch for your for your wettest days. You should have come to the rain, the rain garden talk a little while ago. <laughs> so, um, so this one, so here's my rule of thumb is, I, I mean, I've got, I've done enough where I can just kind of gauge it. I can eyeball it. I wouldn't recommend you guys doing that. And so I can eyeball how much heavy I think it should be, and then make it twice as big. But so the, the more scientific way of doing that is, so most of these, you want to have them the, at the deepest part, the main collection area, at least six inches. So if you're if you're if you're basing the six inches deep, and you have decently draining soil, so it means your soil can drain faster than one inch an hour, then this main receiving area can be four percent of the size of the area it's collecting from. So let's say let's say let's say let's say I don't know that was a lot in one statement, but I'll, I'll explain a little better. So let's say if you have a Let's say if you have a 10 by 10 roof, let's just say this is 10 by 10 roughly, it almost is. Um, let's say a little garden shed roof. And you want to collect all the, all the rainwater that falls on this roof, you want it to collect into one, one, um, one location, one rain garden area. So if, you have, if you're going to do it six inches deep, and it's uh, well-drained soil, it can be 4% of the size of this. So this is a thousand, this is a thousand square feet. No, hundreds of feet, then it can be four square foot of rain, of rain garden. There's a great video right now on the California Native Plant Silicon Valley website. It's an hour long lecture on everything you want to know about yeah. how to determine that. It's great. Yeah. I just listened to it. Yes. Yeah. Um, Laura Prickett, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it wonderfully done. And so that's, that's kind of the rule of thumb. That's if it's a well 
drained soil. If you have poor drained soils, the rule of thumb is it needs to be 50% of the size of the roof. So let's say, let's say we have that same roof we just talked about, and you have the same garden shed roof that you want to collect all the rainwater from. It needs to be 50% of the size of this roof. Which still, I mean, it sounds like a lot, but it's actually really not that bad in your terms of you know, your garden space, as long as you have a decently sized you know, average garden. You know, it needs to be half of this. So that's, and that's, but that's only for that one, that one, that one gutter. So most, most houses are going to have four or five gutters. So you're not taking out the whole house gutter, just the part of the house that that gutter is collected from. And that's, those are just sort of rules of thumbs. And so you really want to do a percolation test before you do that. Test your soil and know where your water is running out before you do that. So I'm not sure how many more slides we have. We can get it close. Um, so here's another example of a rain garden. Um, so this was, this was a fun one to do. Um, so this lady had put in, we did the garden, and as we, as we were there doing the garden, I realized that she had this gutter that went to nowhere. So before we, before we showed up, this gutter just ended right here, and it, the water just basically just pooled on the deck. So I don't, know, I don't know if that was the deck installer or the guy from the gutter, but there was no communication between the, those contractors and the homeowner because that, there was no thought put into where that water went. So we showed up and there was this moss growing out around, it was all green, and the wood was all soft because it, it was being destroyed by the water. So I said, why don't we just cut a hole, I'll get a $5 piece of plastic right underneath here, and just save your $20,000 deck with a five dollar solution that the guy who installed it should have given you ten years ago. And so we just took that and now put in a whole dry creek in it now. And saved her, her debt probably. And it was such an easy solution. And actually almost everything in this garden was completely salvaged material. The redwood rounds were salvaged. The, all of the um, bricks in the back are salvaged. The mulch is salvaged redwood. Um, grinds. And very, I think the only thing we bought from the store was just the, the rock and the plants that we propagated ourselves. So almost completely salvaged, repurposed material. There's no irrigation at all, all of the zero escaped. There's no plastic weed blocker, no pesticides, the fertilizers, all the mulch in here is all, um, I don't have a slide for it, but if you guys want to get free compost, uh, you can get uh, free compost from the mushroom farms in Morgan Hill, Monterey Mushroom. And so as long as you have a truck, you just drive up, Walk into the office, nice old lady at the office, just say, hey, I need five yards, two yards, whatever. She gives you a little tag, you drive up to the field, guy comes up with the tractor, puts in your back, you drive away. I mean, it's the so smart simple. Station. Smart station. Dude. Smart station, you have to be a single resident. Mm -hmm. And they're a lot stricter about that now than it used to be. Yeah. I think yeah. there's a few cities. Yeah. And the other cities are having their own little operations similar to the smart station, too. Or if you, if you know, if you have a friend in Sunnyvale, Go buy him some beer and bring him with you and say, hey, here's my buddy. He lives here and get you. <laughs> um, so, yeah. What mushroom farm is that? It's Monterey Mushroom. And they're in, it's off Bailey Road. And they're, they're really great. And if you don't want to go all the way down to Bailey Road, you've got a Payless Rockery. And they sell the exact same mushroom compost. We either pay for it, but they'll deliver it and you can get it without having to go down there. I've even seen the Payless truck they're getting it for free, while I'm getting it for free, and then they go there and they take to the store and they sell it. So I was like, oh, no, you trick. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's the end of my slides. So it's interesting so, they didn't choose to have any landscaping as a screen in their backyard, so they didn't have issues with the sun or privacy or... Back in here? The slide you just finished, yeah. The last I one. think they leave the trees. They have some yeah. fruit trees, but there's, are there some shrubs that are there? garden here? Yeah. Yeah, there? these are... We have two deciduous. This is a this is a, a large vine maple that just hasn't leafed out oh, yet. Okay. This is an apricot tree. Um, this is a fig tree back here, and we planted okay. one more tree back there too. She was she was really in the edibles and, 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 and vegetables, so we actually planted a lot of fruit trees. They're just this was planted, I want to say like in February, so things hadn't really leafed out yet. And you said that there's no irrigation, so she's and for the first year with the natives, you kind of have to. Have water a little bit, so they're just doing it by hand? Until October. Oh. So basically, you know, six months or so. Well, you know, most of these plants, even that first period you're hand watering, I mean, if you do it right, you can be out there maybe every fifth day, every day, maybe once a week. Mm -hmm. 
most native plants, if, you, if you're trying to mimic their natural water cycle, we get heavy rains sporadically. So they don't, they, they, so if you're trying to mimic that, right. really, really heavy water. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally, and totally. That cycle. Yeah, and so, and basically, I, I kind of start out with that concept, once a week, heavy watering infrequently, and as there's new growth, I, I, I kind of step back every time I see some new growth. And so I, basically, I, and the way I see it is, as there's new growth on top, things happen with the roots below. That's my sign. As the roots are getting more and more established, that's, that means to me you can cut back the water more and more. Once October hits, plants don't ever get water ever again. Plus, you have all mulch. Yeah, that's the benefit. So if you're getting this free mulch, I mean, you can just put that mulch, it can be six inches thick. And you, when you do water, it holds it in so much longer well, than that garden was out. You want the roots to take. Yeah. You want it to go down. Versus if you're doing mulch you paid for, you're going to do just have to cover the soil. That's not only getting the benefit of keeping the water in, which is the main goal. I mean, mulch is never intended to look pretty in your garden. It's to keep organic matter on your on your ground, you know, above your soil level. So it's, yeah. You said you had some thoughts about termites. Oh, yeah, so termites. So if you're concerned about using um, arbor mulch or whatever mulch you're using to keeping it from attracting more termites, a couple rules of thumb is keep as much woody material away from your foundation of your house, so at least 18 inches. The, the gap between your, your 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 house and where the mulch starts, so have, so have about 18 inches of just completely bare soil. If you're, if, you're, if you're concerned about it, just don't have any mulch at all, right? That's strip right for your house. Don't water it and don't have any mulch. You mean besides the 18 inches, another 8 inches? 18 inches of no planting area? and no mulch. You can plant stuff there, but if you are going to plant anything there, have it be something that doesn't have a lot of, doesn't, isn't really woody. So maybe things like hookra, maybe a fern or two, so it's not going to attract a lot of, you know, decomposers. So you can have some really big woody shrub that gets water all the time, it's nice and shady, I mean, you're basically creating termite habitat. So, and in keeping and if, if you notice, if, if you're either your foundation of your house, then you, where the bottom of your stucco starts, you don't want to pile up your mold, your compost, it's right below the stucco. You want to maintain that gap of the foundation so there's less of a, of a transition for the termites to come around your house. And just keep, don't water by your foundation. Don't have irrigation around by your foundation. Those are all tips to keep it more termite safe. Don't have your rain spouts by your foundation. Yeah, I mean, don't have your rain spout go to nothing and just sit on your deck. <laughs> Yeah. So then, if, but if you say 18 inches of dirt, well, now you're going to be dabbing weeds. So, would you, what else might you put there? Either cement, or I mean, what's, it, something what's the bigger issue? What's more important to you? you every every homeowner is going to be different. Yeah, the you recycled know? Did you mean do you sleep better at night thinking of some weeds out there, or we're concerned about termites? So right. whatever makes yeah. whatever it's your home, every home is going to be a little different. So here's it's a great reason to use. You know, alternative building materials. You're not using as much wood. You know, even you know, cob buildings. You know. Straw bill houses all completely termite free. You're never gonna get any termites those kinds of houses, other kinds of building materials. So, just like just like we're thinking outside the box of how we design our gardens, we should be the same thing how we design our houses. Does the cardboard attract termites? Um, not any more than other mulch, because basically they'll eat anything cellulose, and cardboard still has cellulose in it, so they will still eat cardboard. But there's not as much material. I mean, they'll you know they can't. It's like a long-term source of cellulose in cardboard, like there is like a log. So it's not as much of a concern. But anything with cellulose. Well, I've had to, I've had to turn them in my house. So that's why I asked. Yeah. And just, just re reducing your water overall will reduce the termites dramatically. In the whole garden. In the whole garden. Just not having any irrigation, just zero escaping your garden will reduce termites. Do you have a question again? Sorry. So that's basically my whole spiel. If you guys have any additional questions or thoughts, comments, please feel free. Yeah. Uh, you designed gardens. Uh -huh. How much did you go over how much, how much you guys cut the water cost for them of irrigating these gardens? On most of these, I mean, after the, the fill in time, 100%. I mean, I have gardens where I did a I garden on 13th Street in downtown, okay. and she's like, I don't weed, I don't water, I don't do anything in this garden. I mean, and come out and it's just blooming. She said that they said the family walked by, like a family four walked by, and they, they hung out and are playing in a garden for an hour, just like hanging out in a garden. And she's like, I don't do anything. I don't trim it. I don't maintain it. I don't water. I don't do anything. And it just looks great all the time. And so I mean, that is 100% water savings. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
great. Because so. do you think it's because of the fact that you have the water drain and it's percolating down into the ground and so you have basically a permeable ground underneath it plus the mulch? It's a combination of factors. I mean, just using native plants okay. already is going to reduce your water need and using the right native plant okay. kind of the right time of year. Okay. You know, the appropriate way of getting them established using the right mulch. So it's not, there's not one thing that's making it. It's, it's just a It's just using all those things in conjunction at the right time in the right way. And actually, I, the, the demonstration I was going to do was I was going to do a little talk on how to plant a plant. I, that is, I think, to me, of all those things I just mentioned, I think that's the biggest thing is people don't know how to plant a plant. I mean, people, people plant a plant. So you have this, this, this plant with this perfectly draining nursery soil that's designed to drain, you know, in one day so you can get water every day and never get soil logged. You have this crappy Santa Clara Valley. I like to, I like to play soil, but it's still crappy. And it doesn't drain like our our our, our native our the nursery soil. So you're taking this really well drained soil, this soil that drains, doesn't drain at all. You dig your hole, and you plant it in the ground, and you don't shake it. You keep the root ball nice and big, concrete root ball, and then you're like, wow, how, how come my roots don't go anywhere? Well, what is the incentive for those roots to go anywhere when it's concrete all around it and it's nice, beautifully well-draining soil? So there's, there's no, the roots never go anywhere. The, the plant dies, come out a year later, it's like, whoop, and the whole root ball comes in with one big shot, hasn't done anything. It's like, well, you, you, who planted this plant? Like, you need to combine the soil, drainage types. So I swear planting the plant right, I think is 95% of making your garden. I wish I could do it. I wish I could do it here in front of you and show you how to plant a plant. Right? I mean, I, I, I get I get my root ball and I just destroy the root ball. I, I mean, you look like people think it's gonna die. I'm like, it's gonna help the plant actually. I, the natives, you, you can't disturb the root ball. That's bullshit. Really? Whoever's saying that, that's bullshit. Really? I take these roots and just com I mean, I, I cut out all the dead roots, just break up the root ball completely. Take the native soil, just mix it completely together. Put six inches of compost mulch on there. Water heavy. Some of those plants I never ever water again. They get water once, and I they, they I leave, and they thrive. And that it's nice. Well, I like doing that in October, right for the rains. If I know it's going to be a big rainstorm, I'll go and plant all my plants. They get that one rain, and they get and they never get water again, and they thrive. Yeah. Alan, uh, you know I know some people who take the pot after you know your one gallon pot or whatever you bought. Yeah. Take the pot out, let it sit in a bucket of water, and yeah. pretty soon the soil starts. Just flowing away yeah. from it, and the root ball gets really soft yeah. and malleable, you know, and then you can sort of spread it yeah, out totally. and do exactly yeah. what he's saying. Yeah. Yep. And, you, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, I plant a plant and half of them die. Yeah. But if you're doing it his way, you get none of them die, yeah. you know. And it's, it, it's really important. The other thing is, don't be afraid to plant from seed. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, that's great. Because, so I've got oak trees. Mm. Sometimes I'll see a little baby oak tree this big, right? Mm. What's happening underground? The roots are this deep. Yeah. Okay? And now, when, but when you buy a tree at a nursery, you got a tree that's this big. And how big are the roots? Yeah. Well, it's in a five gallon container or maybe even a one gallon container or something those roots have tried to go on down and they've been stymied by plastic so if if you start from small pots it's better than big pots yeah. many times yeah. and if you if you've got a root bound uh, if you buy something and it's root bound you didn't realize it when you're at the nursery <coughs> let it sit in water, <coughs> see if you can, once it's really nice and soft, you can sort of massage the roots out, get them started going out, and then don't water right by the base of the plant. The plant will go for the water. Exactly. So water a couple of feet away from the plant. When, 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 when people plant the plant incorrectly, and they put like the drip irrigation going right there, so it's like right by the trunk, mm -hmm. And they have, there's no connection with the, the nursery soil and the native soil. I almost think it's like an IV. So it gets this, it gets this water. It doesn't. It never does anything else. It just it's like addicted to water. It doesn't set any new roots out. It's like why am I going to do anything? I get my water right here. I got my nice little soil right here, and it just never creates any new roots ever. It, that, it has no. 
incentive to do that. What's the rule of thumb for the soil preparation? Like if you have maybe a two gallon plant, how far out? If it's two gallon, I try and dig my hole about twice as big as the actual pot is. And that gives me enough room to mix in the native soil with the soil in the pot. So kind of a fine soil and native soil, 50-50. Mm -hmm. And one thing too about, about buying plants, and planting plants from seed, when you go to the nursery, don't be scared to take that pot and just rip it right out of the pot. The plant right out of the pot and look at the look how root bound it is. If it looks like you just see a wall of roots everywhere, like just top to bottom, every stone by that plant, just put it back. I don't want that. One. So as a plant that looks less healthy in the nursery, it's probably gonna be better in your garden because it's not as root bound. So don't don't feel like I mean they're gonna get mad at me. Just pull it right out of the pot, look at it, take a look at it. If it doesn't look good, put it back. If it's got a, if you see some grubs in there and a bunch of Roots, like don't take, don't buy that plant. Buy the one looks nice and you want white roots, nice fleshy roots. Looks like there's still like little white hairs. That's that's what you want. So always inspect the plant before you buy it. And, and what, what Steve was saying about the the, the tap roots is especially plants like um, like oaks and buckeyes who have a really really strong central tap root. Buying in a pot, you basically kill that whole its whole ability to be drought tolerant. And they're drought tolerant because of that tap root. And that once in the pot, it killed that whole ability for them to be dry <coughs> because it doesn't have a tap root anymore. I had a great example at, at Middle Earth Gardens. I used to be the propagation manager there. They had a big oak tree they planted there. It looked, looked great. It was doing fine. And the, the squirrel just plopped a little acorn right next to it. Two years later, the one that the squirrel dropped was three times the size of the one that was maybe 10 or 15 years old. And this, that came in a 15 gallon pot, and that thing had done nothing since it had been planted, but the one from the acorn was just shooting up. Because that one had tack root got established right there, but never got obstructed, never got cut or you know t tangled up. So it just beautifully deep tap root, and that created a much stronger plant. That never got water, never got planted, because the squirrel put it in there. Never got any kind of water at all. So that's an example of how it's these, these ways of making the plants drop tolerance. It's really simple. It's really not that hard. I think I'm running a little bit out of time, so we guys have any additional questions? Kind of yeah, how about a big hand? Thank you.